All right, we are back with a new video, and today we are continuing with the MLP season episode rankings, and today we'll be going through season six, ranking every episode from that season. And I know season six is a bit of a divisive season, particularly with the inclusion of Starlight into the main cast. And along with that, there are some pretty middling episodes within the season that definitely lower people's view of the season per se. Now, admittedly, I think I'm a bit higher on this season than certain other people. I mean, some of that's because I actually like Starlight, and I'm sure other people that like Starlight would agree with me there. And through that, I do think Starlight has some pretty good episodes in this season that makes this a pretty satisfying redemption arc for her. And even some of the episodes outside of that are pretty good, all things considered. Now, admittedly, there are still quite a bit of middling episodes, and we'll definitely get into those along the way. However, I wouldn't really consider anything here to be among the very, very worst in the entire series. There's nothing overly offensively bad per se, but there are still some not great episodes that we'll be getting into on this list. But as usual, there are 24 episodes on this list. Again, if we're including both the Chrysling and Who Weren't Back Again as one episode each. And with that, let's get right into the video. So starting off at number 24, the worst episode in season 6 was kind of easy for me, but I did also debate it with a couple other episodes, but here we have 28 pranks later. Now, the main reason I consider this to be the worst episode of the season is I just don't care about the premise at all. I mean, by the time this episode came out, I mean, we were kind of already getting over the zombie phase that had really plagued a lot of media in the early 2010s. So this episode definitely came out a bit past the trend there, and considering I'm not even a huge fan of that genre, considering how oversaturated it was, I mean, the fact that we got an episode that was kind of like that and kind of gave out those vibes, like, wasn't really my thing to begin with. But then, on top of that, you basically have an episode that feels very similar in a lot of ways to the mysterious mare do -well, where we see Rainbow Dash, like, really not being too pleasant and really in need of learning a lesson and then we see the main six plus everyone else really making sure that she learns that lesson and admittedly i, I kind of get it in the sense that rainbow dash did really do more to deserve it this time i mean one of the most egregious moments right at the beginning of the episode is when rainbow literally pulls a prank on fluttershy when we literally got a moment in guild of the brush off way back in season one where Pinky literally convinces Rainbow to not pull a prank on Fluttershy because she would be very sensitive to it. And yeah, I know some people will say that, oh, Fluttershy has been through some character development, but still not the greatest look that Rainbow literally pulls a prank on Fluttershy here to the point where she literally starts crying, and yet Rainbow doesn't seem to care. And really this whole Rainbow pulling pranks on everyone is a bit much in my opinion. Like, for, for me, like, it wasn't super convincing that Rainbow would go this far in pulling pranks on people, even to the point where they are clearly annoyed by it. So I felt that was a bit manufactured, and then the whole story itself was a bit much, with literally the whole town in on this prank of convincing Rainbow Dash that uh, the town of Ponyville had fallen under this zombie apocalypse, which, again, a bit much, but definitely requires a bit of suspending a disbelief there. And at the end of the day, I'm not entirely sure that it is much of an improvement over the Mysterious Mirror Duel, where it really feels like a lot of this town is just going all in to make sure Rainbow learns his lesson. And yeah, while Rainbow definitely did more to deserve it, I mean, we still had to see Rainbow Dash commit a lot of these pranks, which, again, doesn't feel like the most in-character thing for her, especially this far in the series, but also just not very fun to begin with. So at the end of the day, I feel like this episode just doesn't really do much for me, where despite it attempting to approve upon the series Mary do well, I don't really feel like it was necessarily that much better of an episode in my opinion. Now at the end of the day, I mean, if we are comparing it to other episodes from the series, it's definitely not the worst episode of the series. I think a lot of it stems from me not clicking with it, but man, there are just some moments in there that I just do not click with at, at, at all particularly when Rainbow literally pulls a prank on Fluttershy. So at the end of the day, I can't really defend this episode too much. And because of that, it is here at number 24. Now we're moving on to number 23. And I actually thought coming into this that this would be the bottom ranked episode of season six. However, after thinking about some more, I mean, yes, while it is a largely broken episode, 
there is at least one good scene from it. And plus, um, the rest of it isn't really that offensive to me. But here we have the cart before the ponies. And this episode just doesn't really work on any story level. I mean, really what it comes down to is the CMC not picking the correct partner to help them build their carts. I mean, we see them go to their natural big sister figures to get their help only for the, their interests to not really align at all. I mean, we see early on that Apple Bloom wants the fastest cart, Scootaloo wants the most creative, and Sweetie Belle wants the most traditional, and yet, obviously, those don't really align with what any of their big sister figures are looking out for. And so we have to deal with an entire episode of the big sister figures really taking over and really trying to compensate for something, at least. I mean, we know Rarity, at least, is trying to compensate for having done the derby when she was a filly but came up short there and really it's just kind of annoying for a lot of it I mean we all know that eventually it's all going to fall apart we all know that the big sister figures are going to end up driving the car and really hijacking everything and making the mess and ruining everything and we all know that the CMC are eventually going to open their mouths and just tell them that they're in the wrong and that they need to get out of it I mean it's pretty pretty predictable from beginning to end and, and I don't really find it to be a very interesting story I mean we all know it's going to happen and so much of it is built upon this miscommunication that it doesn't really translate to enjoyment that much as well so I can't really defend this episode too much however the main reason I did put it above 28 pranks later is that well for one I don't feel like it's as offensive as 28 pranks later I mean not that 28 pranks later is an exceptionally offensive episode it's just more so there are just some specific moments from there that really make Rainbow Dash pretty unlikable there, on top of her not really acting in that natural of a way. Whereas Carp Before the Ponies is just largely there. I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't really have much consequence on anything, aside from it being generally annoying. However, there is at least one good scene from there, and that's the actual race itself, where we actually get a pretty catchy song that plays during it and I feel like that does elevate the episode to a degree we get some interesting animation that plays during the song as well particularly with some of the 3d uh projections of the actual carts as well as some of the depth perception in play that did make it somewhat visually appealing for me at least however at the end of the day this is still a pretty bad episode not one I would particularly enjoy re-watching but ultimately one that doesn't really matter much in the grand scheme of things, which is why I did have a one spot higher, a number 23. Now I'm moving on to number 22, and we're kind of sticking with this grouping of episodes that aren't very good and aren't super enjoyable, but probably aren't the worst at the end of the day either. And here we have Where the Apple Lies. And similar to the last two episodes we talked about, this episode was just largely tedious in my opinion and kind of jarring at points where obviously a lot of it is a flashback and kind of a backstory for Applejack teaching us sort of why she is as honest as she is with her literally having this whole string of lies that spends the entire episode. And it did get kind of old pretty quickly where I guess part of the joke is, oh, Applejack is telling all these lies and she's pretty bad at it, but she's got to keep it up. But it just got old pretty quickly and it made a lot of the episode kind of drag in my opinion. I mean, where it's like the whole joke is Applejack is telling a lie and that in turn is making the story more and more ridiculous until eventually culminates with uh, Granny Smith almost being operated upon and she had to literally get into the operating room and really break the news there. So that's not particularly great. And you also have Big Mac in this episode kind of have an arc too where his whole shtick is him talking and being overbearing until he eventually learns to listen more which culminates with him not talking at all, which honestly wasn't really the approach I would have gone with with his character. Like, I would have been fine if he was just always a bit on the reserve side. So for us to have this backstory where he used to be sort of the opposite, sort of the same, in the same way that Applejack used to be the opposite of what she is, was a bit much for me and didn't really add too much. I mean, it wasn't really the most interesting plot development in my personal opinion. And at the end of the day, this episode is just kind of there... I mean, it's just kind of something where, yeah, you get a bit of backstory, but even then, like, I kind of forget this episode exists sometimes as 
obviously kind of gets overshadowed in season seven with the perfect pair, which actually gives us some meaningful backstory into the Apple family. I mean, this is just kind of there. I'm not entirely sure why this episode even exists per se, but similar to the cart before the ponies, it's pretty inoffensive and it's just kind of there to fill up a spot in the episode count. So I can't fault it too much and I can't be too mad of it, but it's still a largely underwhelming story in my personal opinion. So because of that, it is here at number 22. Now we're moving on to number 21 and I kind of juggled this episode as well within this tier of episodes as I don't really see this as a good episode per se. It's just a matter of whether I thought it was going to be towards the bottom or if it was going to be a couple spots higher. And given this placement here, I kind of decided on the latter. But here we have Newbie Dash. And I think for me, and I'm sure a lot of other people agree with this, I mean, this was not that great of an episode to introduce us to Rainbow Dash being in the Wonderbolts at the end of the day. Now, I kind of get what type of story they were going for, and I kind of understand the message they were going for as well. However, I don't think it's executed particularly well. I think a lot of it is really undercut by the fact that we not only know from previous episodes that Rainbow Crash is a particularly traumatic uh, nickname for a rainbow, and in turn, we know that it is linked to some insecurities and stuff like that and some issues that she had in her childhood. We literally get a flashback in this episode that shows Rainbow Dash as a filly being called that nickname by her bullies. And yet it the episode just forgets about it afterwards. Like we get the flashback and just get the general sense of why Rainbow Crash is an offensive nickname for her and why she doesn't really want it. But then it just literally spends the rest of the episode ignoring that baggage per se. And then by the end, like she kind of just accepts it because all the other Roman Nurbolts like accept it as well. I mean, again, I kind of get what they were going for and how they wanted to make it seem like, oh, the, these nicknames aren't as big of a deal as you think they are. However, considering the fact that we literally see that this particular nickname goes back to Rainbow Dash's childhood and how it has some deep connotations there, I feel like that message kind of falls apart. I feel like it would have worked better if they had gone with an entirely new nickname for Rainbow, something that wasn't Rainbow Crash. And, you know, like if they want to still go with that, maybe not show the flashback within the episode, like just make it something that Rainbow's kind of embarrassed by and make it something that she really wants to shake off because she doesn't want to come off as a bad flyer per se. I mean, they could have gone with that approach, and I feel like it would have worked better had they gone with that. But instead, they go out of their way to highlight that this particular nickname isn't just some pride thing, per se. That does sort of go back to a really sore spot in Rainbow Dash's life. And yet they just completely ignore that afterwards. Like, I don't know. I felt like that kind of got in the way of things. And aside from that, the rest of the episode isn't particularly that enjoyable either. Now, obviously, the most notable scene from this episode is when Rainbow is trying to mimic the rest of her friends to try to get a new nickname. And I'm kind of on the fence with this. I mean, on one hand, it is kind of amusing seeing her like put on this performance and her having these different main styles and her like trying to imitate them to the best of her ability. But then we see her like trying to come up with all these new nicknames for her, even ones that I don't think she would even be that proud of. Like she wants to be called Caramare. Like what? So I don't know. I And plus, I felt like that scene kind of dragged on a bit too long as well. So uh, at the end of the day, it's sort of a mixed bag for me. At the end of the day, I feel like this episode isn't that great. I mean, again, in large part because the message is kind of undermined by certain things that the episode could have actively avoided. And in turn, the rest of the episode just is kind of a drag as well. And I really feel like that defines a lot of the episodes in this bottom tier in that they're not necessarily actively bad episodes as more as they are defined by just being kind of boring. So I feel like that's kind of where I stand on here. And while it's not the most boring per se, and it's not the one that's most devoid of anything interesting, I still feel like 21 is about as high as I can put it. Now I'm moving on to number 20, and I know some people may think this is a bit too high, and I know there are people who definitely see this as one of the worst episodes of the series, and I'm not saying it's good per se, however, I don't think it's as bad as some people claim it might be, but here we have PPOV, and the thing about this episode is, 
obviously it has a very underwhelming conclusion where it turns out that the entire conflict was caused by this random sea monster that the like characters didn't really know about which in turn caused the ship to crash and for them to just blame each other for it which is kind of weird i mean and the fact that we don't really get any foreshadowing for it in any of the stories that applejack pinky or rarity share again leads to it being kind of something that was pulled out of the writer's butt per se so i don't think it's really good in that regard and plus a lot of it you know like is stemming from a miscommunication like the fact that the characters were kind of exaggerating just how bad things were and in turn really just being mad at each other for seemingly petty reasons isn't great at the end of the day for me however the thing about this episode is i do kind of enjoy the exaggerations that each of the characters give while they're giving their side of the story i mean the one that jumps out to me the most is when applejack is delivering the story and pinky is just this brain dead uh character that just chomps on everything and just says the most random things you know, and you have other stuff too, like the fact that Rarity has these over-the-top outfits and the other character stories as well does lead to this episode being mildly amusing in my opinion, just seeing the ways in which each of, each of the stories are different. However, at the end of the day, I can't really say this is a meaningful episode as well. Again, it all just comes down to a miscommunication, and even the resolution is one that makes me wonder why this conflict even happened to begin with. So I can't have this episode too high because of that. I mean, it doesn't really work too well as a story. However, the fact that the stories and each side of the story just give me some mild amusement is enough for it to land here on number 20. Now we're moving on to number 19, and we have one of the more unusual episodes. But here we have Applejack's Day Off. And the thing about this episode is, I whenever I think about it, it tends to feel like a boring episode. And to be fair, when I am watching it, I mean, a lot of it is not the most riveting stuff in the world. However, I will admit that the actual conflict, per se, of how Applejack's issue isn't so much that she has a lot to do, it's just that she's doing it in a really inefficient way, is really kind of bizarre at the end of the day. I mean, the fact that she has to go through all these rituals and do all these ridiculous steps in order to just get through her chores was a really underwhelming way of resolving the conflict and in turn I feel like in turn that kind of undermines the episode. Now I kind of agree with the message of the episode in the sense that Applejack is putting her work before her friends and that she's trying to learn to manage her time a bit better. However I feel like they could have done it in a slightly better way than what they did here where it just turns out that all of a sudden she's being all gung-ho about doing these dumb rituals in order to complete her chores. However, I will say there are a couple moments in the episode that I did find semi-amusing, particularly the scene when Applejack is trying to fix the uh, the pipe that burst in the spa. And yes, while it's not the most interesting thing in the world, I don't know, like some of those moments there, like when we see this dramatic reveal of her putting on her belt when she's getting started with work is kind of funny in a way, although not in the way that I can elevate the episode too much. So at the end of the day, I can't say this is a great episode per se. However, there are a couple moments that do give me some amusement that do lead me to put it here at number 19. Now we're moving on to number 18, and we have an episode that I'm, I'm a little conflicted by in that I do think it has a somewhat interesting premise, but I feel like in execution, it doesn't ha quite handle it the best. But here we have Viva Lost Pegasus. And I will admit that this episode definitely attempted to tell an interesting story, particularly with Gladmane being this manipulative antagonist by trying to sow distrust among all the performers and then making him seem like they're their only friends so that they don't leave, basically creating this weird codependency in order to prevent his resort from losing all the high-end talent that he currently has and Obviously, a lot of the episode is about Applejack and Fluttershy exposing him. However, I will say that in execution, this idea, while interesting, has some lingering issues that I feel like aren't properly addressed. Like, yes, I get the idea of him driving a wedge between Flim and Flam so that they don't rely on each other and that they don't get the idea to leave because they're too busy arguing. However, I feel like realistically, doing that would just promote promote them to separate entirely and the fact is they're still working 
in the same place, even with Gladmane being there to be their friend, I feel like it's sort of weird that Flem and Flem don't seriously consider the idea of just moving away. Like one of them just leaves entirely just so they don't have to put up with the other anymore. And I feel like the episode doesn't address that aspect to it super well to where it really feels like Gladmane is the only option and they didn't really think through the whole idea. So they just gave the excuse of the characters are just too busy arguing to even consider all their other options, which again, I appreciate the creativity, but I feel like an execution is just not entirely there. So there's that aspect to it. And also, I mean, I know that's a common trope at the end of the day, but I didn't like how the conflict was resolved where they basically tricked Gladmane into emitting all this over the intercom and then just having his house of cards come falling apart. I feel like they definitely could have exposed him a little better than that and could have come up with a slightly better idea, but it's not terrible per se. So at the end of the day, I feel like this episode, again, has some decent ideas, and I feel like had they thought things through a little bit better, they could have told a somewhat compelling story of showing Gladmane's manipulation and really showing how he's able to use the ideas of friendship in order to get some personal gain and undermine the happiness of others. But I feel like in execution, it definitely leaves some stuff to be desired. So I can't reward it too much, but it is at least interesting enough to be here at number 18. Now we're moving on to number 17, and we have an episode that probably doesn't have as interesting of a premise as Viva Las Pegasus, but I do feel like it does execute it upon it slightly. But here we have Dungeons and Discords, and this is an episode I've talked about a number of times on this channel now, simply because it has Discord and Spike in it. And admittedly, I'm not a huge fan of the premise. I think I've made that pretty clear up to this point. I mean, Discord is pretty annoying for a lot of it. And I don't like how towards the end, Spike and Big Mac turn around basically for seemingly little reason. I mean, they just kick Discord out and then they just feel a little bad and then they cave. They let Discord back in and then everything's just fine and dandy again. I mean, it's just kind of whatever for me. And yeah, there are a couple interesting moments, particularly where Discord is trying to bring the game to life in order to immerse themselves more into it, only for that to all fall apart. However, again, I can't say it's necessarily the worst episode in the world. I feel like it doesn't have as many plot holes as Viva Las Pegasus. And plus, it does at least have that interesting idea of Fluttershy pitying Discord that she is essentially his only friend and she's trying to get him to hang out with others only for Discord to feel like he's too proud to stoop to spike in Big Max level only for him to come around by the end. So at least there's that. But at the end of the day, this is a Discord episode and not one that I love. However, it is certainly one of the better Discord episodes at the end of the day. Again, I talked about that in previous videos. However, when we're comparing it to the rest of season six, I feel like it's just not the best episode. Definitely not one of my favorites. So I do have to leave it here at number 17. Now we're moving on to number 16, and I know there are people that really enjoy this episode, and it's certainly not a bad one. However, I've always been a little underwhelmed by it, but here we have Spice Up Your Life. And to me, this is a pretty standard be yourself story. I mean, we see Pinky and Rarity come to Canterlot, and they see the zesty tree, and they spend a lot of the episode trying to figure out how to generate business with Rarity trying to go with the more high society route and getting them to conform to that, while Pinky is trying to really get the publicity out and really embrace everything that makes this restaurant so unique. And obviously, Pinky does win out at the end with her like really allowing the restaurant to truly thrive and really embrace a lot of the recipes that they've really come to adore. And in turn, we hear a lot of city folk talking about how all the restaurants are the same. They just conform to the same high society standards. But here's a restaurant that actually has heart. And yeah, it's a pretty standard story at the end of the day. Not super duper interesting. You know, like in even the song, I mean, I don't know. I've always found the song a little, little janky. I mean, it's not a bad one by any means. I mean, we do see the interesting counterparts between Pinky and Rarity with the different advice that they're giving. But I don't know, it wasn't really my musical style. And even the credit character that, that comes in and really berates the restaurant. I mean, I don't know. I just felt like this weird jab at high society. And in general, I wasn't a massive fan of that. So, you know, like it's it is what it is. It's not a bad episode. I mean, it definitely functions well as a story. 
but it's just not the most interesting for me. So because of that, I do have it here at number 16. Now we're moving on to number 15, and I feel like we're starting to move on to a new tier on this list where we're definitely getting into some good episodes and episodes where I do get a decent amount of enjoyment out of them. However, they're definitely not among the very, very best. And it, honestly, I feel like a lot of these episodes are pretty close to each other, if I'm being perfectly honest. And it's just a matter of separating my personal enjoyment of them that allows me to rank them accordingly. So at number 15, probably the episode that is the least impressive, but is still somewhat enjoyable is Buck Ball Season. And the thing about Buck Ball Season, really my favorite part of this episode, is the fact that it is one of the few episodes in the series that focuses on Fluttershy and Pinky. And just hearing Andrea Libman talking to herself for a lot of it is a very interesting aspect to it. Now, obviously, that is a bit more of a biased take at the end of the day, but I do think they have somewhat good chemistry together. And the story itself isn't that bad either, where we see Fluttershy and Pinky being good at buckball and really just enjoying it, like and trying to make it something to have fun with. And in turn, that allows them to be pretty good. However, it's only when Rainbow and Applejack try to make them more competitive and try to make it less of a game and more of a job that causes their confidence to suffer, causes their overall ability to suffer, and in turn, they just come to hate the sport and try to run away, being too afraid to deal with the disappointment of them not living up to the expectations that others set for them. So that is something, at least. And again, this episode is not a bad one by any means, despite it being relatively lower on this list. However, I feel like outside the fact that it's Fluttershy and Pinky spending all this time together, I feel like the episode itself probably isn't the most impressive at the end of the day. Like the ideas I introduce, yes, they're definitely relatable and definitely made for a good story. However, again, sort of similar to Spice Up Your Life, a lot of the message comes down to be yourself and don't do stuff because others expect you to, which again, can be interesting at times, but at the end of the day is a pretty common trope that you see in a lot of stuff like this. So I can't have it super duper high, but it is enjoyable enough for it to be here at number 15. Now we're moving on to number 14, and we definitely have one of the more notable episodes from this season, and definitely one that is open to debate. Probably not as much as certain other episodes that fit within its category, but still nonetheless. But here we have Stranger Than Fan Fiction, and I don't know about this episode. I mean, it's definitely one of the more enjoyable ones. I mean, it's definitely in this tier of episodes. And I kind of like some of the quote unquote self-aware jabs that it gives towards fandoms in general. This episode obviously introduces us to Quibble Pants, who is voiced by Patton Oswald. Again, another celebrity guest cameo. And similar to Weird Al, another guest cameo that I actually kind of like. I mean... Obviously, people know him as Remy from Ratatouille, although personally, I know him best as Spence from King of Queens, but, you know, like, he's kind of in a lot of things, so you kind of expect that. And for the most part, I definitely like his character. I mean, he definitely plays up this more, I guess, super fan, and this fan that tends to nitpick a lot of stuff, but by the end, kind of, kind of comes to realize that, at the end of the day, it's about enjoying the works over, like, nitpicking little flaws with it. You know, like, so there's that aspect to it, which, again, I could take it or leave it. I mean, on one hand, they kind of have a point, but on the, on the other hand, I can kind of tell that some of it is the writers just trying to defend themselves and definitely reacting to the fandom more than anything else. In general, this episode kind of falls in line with some of the episodes that we see in the later seasons of MLP, where we definitely have some of these episodes like this one, Slice of Life to a degree, and of course, Famous Misfortune, which definitely deal more directly with the fandom and definitely try to go in a less wholesome direction to a degree. And we even have Quipple Pants like say the words fan fiction in the episode, which was something at least. But kind of like what I said at the time I talked about Slice of Life, I'm definitely on the fence when it comes to a lot of these more fandom centric episodes where on one hand, I kind of like the attempt at being more self-aware. I mean, it kind of opens up the door to tell more creative stories. And in turn, you get to definitely be quote unquote witty at points. But on the other hand, I kind of wish that it stayed a little bit more self-contained. I feel like it can be very easy to get carried away with a lot of these stories and just make it like either about bashing the fans or about like just replacing like actual 
like interesting stories and interesting characterizations with just self-aware commentary. And at that point, it turns more into an episode of Family Guy, which again, just talks about like nothing for a lot of it. So I'm definitely of two minds when it comes to this. And again, I definitely think this is one of the better examples of this trope. I mean, I don't think it quite goes down the rabbit hole that things like this can go down in other shows and other like works per se. However, at the end of the day, I kind of wish that they kind of stuck more in their lane per se. And I feel like there are just other episodes that tell more interesting stories in this one where I feel like a lot of your enjoyment with this episode is going to be dependent on knowing about the fandom outside of the show. And just on its own, it kind of kind of falls in deaf ears to a degree. So I feel like that kind of harms it. So I can't have the episode super duper high, although, again, I do enjoy it. And I do think that compared to what it could have been, it could have definitely been a lot worse than it ended up being. So because of that, I do have it here at number 14. Now we're moving on to number 13, and again, we have another good enough episode, but definitely one that can be a bit bogged down by its pacing, but here we have On Your Marks, and this is an episode I talked about in a previous video, and definitely one that has one of the more interesting premises as well, although to be fair, a lot of that was generated by the natural progression of the series, where obviously a lot of it focuses on the CMC dealing with the fact that they can no longer just go on adventures to get their kini marks because... Well, they have their cutie marks now, and a lot of the episode is focused on them trying to do other things, only for them to get completely sidetracked, and then them realizing that they definitely want to do other things on their own, and through that, Apple Bloom was sort of left a bit sad, feeling like maybe her friends don't want to spend as much time with her anymore, when in reality, they just wanted to try other things and, and again, kind of see the world to a degree, so at least... There's that to a degree. There's a song, which is good enough on its own. And for whatever reason, whenever I think of this episode, I tend to think of the side plot of her helping Tender Taps get over his stage fright. However, that actually is only the, like the last third of the episode. The bulk of the episode is focused on the CMC trying to deal with their post cutie mark reality and just struggling so much. So I don't know. That's just sort of a weird quirk I had with this episode. Now, admittedly, the main thing holding this episode back is that it does get a little boring at points. I mean, it is definitely one of the more slower paced episodes. And like I said, the fact that the side plot that I tend to remember this episode the most for doesn't happen until over two thirds of the way in, again, kind of speaks to something. And yes, while a lot of that time is taken up by the CMC, again, like dealing with some pretty interesting stuff, I feel like even that is not executed in quite the best way but it's not bad by any means. So I don't know. I feel like this episode, again, is still pretty good and has some pretty interesting ideas, though probably not the most enjoyable for me. It is here at number 13. Now we're moving on to number 12. And we have an episode that is pretty good. I'm not gonna lie. Although probably not for the reasons that you're expecting, but here we have the times they are a changeling. And I know I've already talked about this episode in a previous video, so you can check that out. But to me, I feel like this episode is still pretty good. I mean, a lot of it does focus on Spike dealing with his like reputation in the Crystal Empire, him being seen as his leader figure that should be respected, and him deciding whether or not to use some of that clout in order to make the people there a bit less bigoted against changelings. However, I think something that I definitely find interesting in this episode is obviously Thorax and him struggling to deal with a lot of his instincts as this changeling that needs love in order to like feed himself and to survive and i find that aspect to it of interesting where we obviously see him disguise himself as a pony that is spike's friend and him just going around a crystal empire being accepted at first because everyone thinks he's a pony but then he just gets up to flurry heart and he's just so overwhelmed by the love in there not only by Flurry Heart, but all the other ponies in there accepting him and being happy to see Flurry Heart receiving him so well that he ends up allowing his instincts to get the better of him. He turns back into a changeling and he sticks his tongue out as if he's about to start feeding out the love, not because he wants to, but because his body is just forcing him to and that this is just to him relying on his instincts in order to survive. And I find that element to be very interesting like the conflict that Thorax faces between his desire of not wanting to hurt others, but also leaning into his instincts that are 
baked into his genetics, basically. And again, everything that he's just known for his entire life. So I do find that element of it to be pretty interesting. Now, admittedly, the episode doesn't focus as much on it. I mean, it really just treats it more as the reason why Thoris gets caught. But however, I do think that aspect is somewhat interesting and obviously is addressed in the season finale where eventually all the changings are reformed and basically they become a new society that feeds off friendship and like not just drains others of their love and stuff. So again, you know, you could definitely debate it, but I personally find that aspect to be pretty interesting. Obviously, Spike ends up defending Thorax and sings his song, which Admittedly, as time goes on, my opinion of the song has gone up. I remember at the time the episode came out, I was actually pretty low on the song and felt that it was pretty bland. However, definitely the more that I listen to it, I think there is at least some merit to it. And obviously the fact that Spike is sacrificing a lot here in order to try to change their minds. And obviously they do at the end of the day. And we get Starlight's line at the end about how you never know when you're going to learn a lesson. So, you know, there's that at least. So this episode definitely has some good ideas, and I do think that, you know, like in some respects, it is an interesting episode to get through. However, I think the top 10 definitely have a bit more going for it. And yes, while this is regarded as one of the better episodes of season six and probably of the series, I do think this episode is a bit overhyped at the end of the day. And I do think there are other episodes that top it in terms of its intrigue, but also its overall entertainment value and execution. So because of that, it is here at number 12. Now we're moving on to number 11. We have an episode that I already talked about in a previous video. And here we have a heartwarming tale. And admittedly, I feel like this episode is largely propped up because it is a quote unquote event episode. It's one of the uh, episodes that is propped up by the fact that it's a musical, the fact that it's just the characters reenacting a Christmas carol. I mean, that really feels more like a status symbol of a long running franchise. The fact that it's getting all these characters together to, again, reenact a Christmas carol is more of a indicator of its longevity as a franchise than as an episode on its own. And that is something that's caused me to hold back a little bit on this as if we're taking that out. I mean, I don't think the story is particularly that interesting. I mean, again, it's literally just a Christmas Carol. And I've definitely gone back and forth over whether there's much merit to Twilight essentially forcing Starlight to celebrate the holiday when she clearly just wants to be left alone. And I've kind of gone back and forth on it. I mean, on one hand, I mean, it's definitely not great that Twilight is essentially equating Starlight's like desire to just relax and just like be by herself and not really you know get too involved in the blast and the flare and stuff like that equating that to a character and a story that literally wants to destroy the world without realizing it so I find that to be a bit of a weird false equivalence and even the episode itself tries to like address that to a degree only for Spike to remind Starlight of her past, which obviously is everyone's favorite running joke in the series. So, I mean, that's not particularly great. So again, not great on one hand. On the other hand, though, I kind of see the rationale for Twilight wanting to get Starlight more involved. I mean, she is trying to teach Starlight about friendship and obviously one part of that is spending time with others and not just being a complete loner. And Considering the fact that this is, again, not too long after Starlight has been brought in as her student, I mean, Twilight definitely probably wants to ensure that Starlight is really getting the lessons and that she isn't just going to be left in this state to where she could easily revert back to her old ways. And considering that is one of the more interesting aspects of Starlight's redemption arc and is something I had to take into account here. So, again, I do feel like my opinion on this whole situation has gone up to a degree over time although again it's still not without its faults there so there's that at least but in terms of the actual like story i mean you know like it's your pretty standard christmas carol story they obviously leave out a lot of the more convoluted details and some of the more details that probably are not suited for this show's demographics i mean obviously the fact that there's no tiny tim counterpart for one is something Obviously, the fact that they don't focus on the fact that Starlight severely underpays uh, Rainbow Dash, I mean, compared to what Scrooge does to Bobby Cratchit in the actual story. So there's that aspect to it. It obviously ignores some of the, 
you know, like broader political issues that are presented through this, the actual Christmas Carol story. I mean, yes, in this episode, they do talk about the literal end of the world happening there. But again, they definitely try to streamline things the best that they can here, which is understandable. But again, we're just going through the motions here with this Christmas Carol's thing. So there's that. But however, I do think that despite it, like not being too much outside of it being an event episode, at the end of the day, it is still an event episode. It is a full on musical with tons of songs in it. And the songs for the most part are pretty good. I mean, I do especially like Pinky's song that she sings in the middle of it, which is pretty catchy in its own right. And people also talk about Luna's Future as a good song on its own. I mean, not my personal favorite, but still pretty good. And again, just contributes to it being more of an event episode. So at the end of the day, I mean, it, it is a good episode. Definitely one of the more enjoyable ones. But again, I mean, one that is largely built around spectacle. And I realize that there are other episodes that fit this mold as well, like Pinky Pride and Twilight's Kingdom that I talked about in previous videos. However, I feel like those episodes definitely have a lot more interesting plot elements going on and a lot more interesting character aspects going on. Whereas this, it's pretty much just a Christmas Carol for the most part. You know, like some minor things that contribute to Starlight's redemption arc, but for the most part, just a pretty standard story at the end of the day. So I can't have it too much higher than this, but I do have to give it credit. So because of that, I do have to leave it here at number 11. Now we're moving on to number 10, and obviously we're now inside the top 10, and it's just a matter of the order. But here we actually have a pretty interesting episode to consider, and here we have The Gift and Mod Pie. And I feel like a big reason why this episode is as high as it is, is its entertainment value. I actually find this episode to be really hilarious. I mean, obviously it's the episode where... Again, we once again get to see Maud and she gets to spend the day with Pinky and Rarity as they go about the city. And I feel like so much of the humor of this episode comes from Maud and just her deadpan reactions to a lot of things. I mean, one of the biggest, I guess, jokes in the episode is when Rarity is trying to buy her a whole bunch of gifts and she literally buys all this stuff. And then she asks if she likes any of it. And then Maud is like, I like this crack in the pavement. And then she literally takes a picture of it. And the way the scene goes about where she says she likes the crack, then she slowly picks up the camera, takes a picture of it, and then it cuts to flash. Then it cuts to Rarity's face close up. It zooms out showing her slowly losing her mind. And then she's eventually like, what? I don't know. The way in which that scene is just executed, like particularly, I mean, on it, the face of it, it doesn't sound like the funniest scene, but like when you take into account how long it takes for it to build up, I don't know. I just find that aspect to be pretty funny. And then obviously we get the climax where Maud eventually resolves the conflict by like just asking for the party cannon back and Rarity really hypes it up as if Maud is his really aggressive personality that's about to burst, which, you know, given her calm demeanor, I mean, seems pretty plausible enough. So I feel like Maud really provides a lot of entertainment here. But I also think aside from that, this episode has a pretty decent and relatable story here. Pinky wanting to get a good gift for Maud here, considering that Maud always gives her good gifts, but she is never able to really return the favor. And I don't know, I just find that story to be pretty relatable. I mean, I know I've kind of struggled in my own life to give people gifts and like, actually give back to people when I feel like they're just giving so much to me. And then whenever I try to give them stuff, they just sort of say that they don't need, I don't need to give them anything. And you know, that in turn makes me feel unsatisfied. So I do find Pinky's conflict here to be pretty relatable. And obviously it's kind of sad to see her give up the party cannon, but obviously it makes it all worth it to her to like get something that Maud wants. And then when Maud finds out about it, I mean, she immediately goes and gets it back and then Pinky sort of left wondering what to do. And then Maud reminds her that it's not about what you get. It's about the relationship there. So I do kind of like the story in that regard and the fact that it does tell a somewhat relatable story at the end of the day. And again, it does focus on the Pinky Maud relationship, which is definitely one of the more wholesome elements to the show in general. And to see that focused on here is pretty good. 
But between that and just the comedy that this episode displays, that makes it really enjoyable for me. And that's a big reason I have it here at number 10. Now we're moving on to number nine, and we're finally getting on to another Starlight episode here. I mean, technically, Heart's Warring Tale is a general event episode, but it kind of ties into Starlight's story. But here we have a more proper Starlight episode here. But here we have The Chrysling, the season six premiere. And as I said in previous videos, this is a pretty solid two-parter for the most part. Now, admittedly, the actual stakes of it aren't as high as certain other two-parters. I mean, at the end of the day, while it does deal with the end of the world, and while the whole conflict of the main six trying to keep, like, the Crystal Ponies from finding out the truth is kind of a rehash of what we saw in part two of the Crystal Empire, but there is enough there outside of that to make it really worth it for me. And I feel like a lot of that comes from Starlight's beginnings, per se, of her redemption arc. We're obviously at the beginning of the episode, we see her trying to find our way around the castle and her just not really knowing where to go, sort of re resembling how she herself is pretty lost at this point. And, you know, like I've said this before, how her appearance here definitely feels very jarring when compared to what we saw to her literally just an episode ago in the cutie remark. However, Again, I feel like they do a decent enough job at showing just how broken down Starlight has become after, one, finding out that her whole revenge plot would have brought about the end of the world, but also her just realizing that, you know, like, all the stuff that she did doesn't really address the issues that she had deep down, which stemmed from her, like, relationship with Sunburst and how that was torn off. And yes, while you can definitely fault the backstory of Starlight for being rushed and not being adequately explained. I do like the way this episode goes about their like reconciliation, how they meet together in the Crystal Empire. And they spent a lot of the episode trying to put on th this act, basically, and making it seem like their lives aren't as miserable as it is. And they're trying to prop up themselves up with Sumber saying that he's this wizard and Starlight trying to keep him from finding out that she spiraled after he left her. So I find that aspect to be pretty interesting. And I do like how Spike is sort of a companion for Starlight throughout a lot of it, how he's trying to like obviously guide her in actually meeting Sunburst, but then obviously giving her advice as well over like her opening up more about her past per se. And the scene in which they do finally let it all out is pretty compelling on its own, where Sunburst says that he struggled a lot in magic school and that it didn't really pan out the way that he thought. And then Starlight, upon realizing this, like she gets pretty upset because it makes it feel like that all the suffering she went through through Star Sunburst leaving was kind of all for nothing in the sense that like at the one positive of her like dealing with the loss of Sunburst was that Sunburst was at least going on to doing bigger and better things than just spending time with her. But to find out that that e isn't even the case, and that she literally went through all this suffering while Sunburst wasn't even benefiting on his own. I mean, I mean, that is a pretty powerful moment right there. And obviously she breaks down to a degree. And then Sunburst, upon figuring out the backstory, says, wait, you figured out how to time travel? And then Spike is like, see, I told you he'd be impressed. I don't know. That's just a pretty fun moment right there. And then seeing like the resolution of the episode where Sunburst is a big piece in resolving the conflict and him sort of coming around to realize the purpose of his cutie mark that it isn't so much about his like proficiency in executing spells. It's more so his proficiency in studying and like really getting into the weeds here and you know, like being able to concoct stuff based off like his research skills. So I do find that aspect to be pretty interesting. And again, in the end, it turns out that Sunburst and Starlight are better off like getting back together and they do ultimately help each other through their issues per se. So I do think that's really what dri what's driving this episode. I mean, if I'm being honest, I feel like if it wasn't for the Starlight stuff, this episode would probably be more towards the middle of the pack. But with that really being a driving force throughout a lot of this two-parter, I do enjoy it quite a bit. And I do like it as a piece of Starlight's redemption arc. So because of that, I do have it here at number nine. Now we're moving on to number eight. And we have an episode that I talked about before in a previous video. And here we have every little thing she does. And this is actually an episode that I've defended in the past. I feel like I like this episode a bit more than a lot of other people. And I get the complaints with it. I mean, obviously a lot of it does center around Starlight 
seeming to revert back to her old ways where she's using magic to control others. And it really feels like she hasn't entirely learned her lesson based on ever since she got her reform. So I can see the debate there. Also considering the fact that she wasn't even that close to the romance of the main six beforehand. And it didn't seem like they had too much input in allowing Starlight into their lives in the first place. I can definitely see this incident being used to really turn the main six against Starlight and really call into question why Starlight was even given a redemption arc to begin with. However, with that said, I do think it still fits into Starlight's character to a degree. I mean, considering the fact that I have talked in the past about how Starlight in season six seems very different from Starlight in season five, and there doesn't seem to be too much of a transition between her old self and her new self, I feel like this was definitely one of the episodes that highlighted her old self in an effort to like do good and in, do, in turn like seeing some of Starlight's character flaws. I mean, she is a very insecure pony. She is a pony that still struggles quite a lot with control issues. And it's very logical based on this episode to see how she resorted to some of the more extreme measures that she did back when she was evil. And now that she's trying to change, I mean, that's definitely an aspect to her character that it, she is struggling to deal with. So I feel like of the ways in which they could have shown some of her more, I guess, evil side and showing us having her having more of a transition compared to what she was before, I feel like this was definitely one of the better case scenarios for that. And I definitely prefer this more than what we see from Discord more often than not, but that's another issue entirely. But aside from that, I do think this is a somewhat entertaining episode as well. I mean, the entire scene when Starlight has all the main six under mind control and we see each of them like acting almost brain dead and like robots is pretty amusing. I mean, seeing them like having these soulless eyes, but then when, when Starlight talks to them, they have this really pleasant mechanical voice like, I mean, I, feel, I find that aspect to be, of it to be pretty entertaining. There's some pretty good moments there as well. And the fact that it ends up backfiring on Starlight because she literally has them do exactly what she says, nothing more, nothing less. They literally act like computers. I do find that pretty entertaining as well. And it does lead to a pretty satisfying downfall there where Starlight does eventually get into trouble. Twilight calls her out and they do have that conversation about why Starlight resorted to this. Her saying that she cared more about doing the tasks well versus actually connecting with the ponies in question. And I do find that aspect to her character pretty relatable as well. You can clearly tell she's still struggling to connect with others and she was worried about performing to her, the best of her ability. And again, that is a somewhat relatable thing that I can struggle with from time to time. It's sort of hard to distance yourself from the activity you're doing from the actual interactions you're doing with the people you're doing it with. So I do find that lesson to be pretty interesting. And then of course we have her resolution of her apologizing to the main six. And at first they seem pretty mad. I mean, rainbow even yells at her and she's like, well, here's a lesson for you. Don't cast spells on your friends. And then Starlight feels bad and walks away you know, like to clean up the mess that she made. And then the others naturally come around and be like, well, she's going to need some help with the cleaning up. And, oh, I got some pictures left over from the castle. I should probably go pick those up. And then Starlight does learn the lesson by the end of connecting more with the rest of the main six. So I do think this is a pretty solid episode at the end of the day. And while I understand a lot of the complaints with it, I do ultimately defend it more than criticize it. Now, again, it's not perfect. I mean, yes, at the end of the day, I feel like this definitely would have worked better had they incorporated the some of these more transitional pieces in some of the other episodes, particularly with Starlight's need to control situations. However, for what it is, I actually do commend it quite a bit. And considering one of my bigger flaws with Starlight's Redemption arc is this lack of a clean transition from her old self to her new self, I do think that this is a pretty welcome introduction to that and something that definitely does more to correct that issue with her redemption arc than to complicate it. So because of that, I do have this episode ranked pretty high at the end of the day. However, I feel like the top seven episodes do have a bit more to offer and they do tend to stand a bit more on their own. So I do have to leave it here at number eight. Now we're moving on to number seven and we just have an all around good episode here to discuss. And here we have Gauntlet of Fire. 
And to me, this is a pretty straightforward episode. I mean, Spike goes on the quest to uh, become the next Dragon Lord and particularly to stop Garble from taking over. We obviously get introduced to Ember in this episode, and I do like Ember as a character, and it's pretty fun seeing her growth arc over the course of this episode where she grows to be attached to Spike and in turn be a bit more soft at the end of the day. And seeing her eventually overcome Garble in order to become the Dragon Lord is a pretty satisfying story at the end of the day. And in general, this is just a pretty solid ride from beginning to end. I don't quite enjoy this episode as much as the others, but it is a pretty well-built episode and one that's pretty enjoyable all around. And I've already talked about this one in a previous video as well, so you can check out my more complete thoughts there. But like I said, it's a good enough episode and I have it here at number seven. Now we're moving on to number six and we have a somewhat notable episode to talk about here. And here we have the Saddle Row review. And again, a lot of people talk about this one as being one of the more uh, funny episodes. And I do agree in a lot of ways. I mean, this is a pretty funny episode, all things considered. And a pretty an unusual episode in terms of its presentation where it's a pretty standard story of Rarity opening up her boutique in uh, Manhattan. And rather than it just being a, your standard story, it, it goes for this more like non-conventional approach where it's like the main six are being interviewed by this uh, news reporter in a diner after the fact. And they're just giving their side of the story. And it keeps going all over the place with different angles of trying to make the place as perfect as possible between the rodents getting in the way. You have Plaid Stripes, the daughter of the landlord that demands to be hired as a condition of Rarity owning the property. You have Pinky trying to tell the party ponies to keep it down only to get him involved in the music there. You have Twilight insisting on sweeping up the whole place to make sure it's clean. You know, there's just a whole bunch of different angles that this episode goes about. Now, did this episode really have any business being as weird and unconventional as it was? Uh, probably not. I mean, they probably could have told a conventional story here, but the fact that they went for this more crazy approach is pretty interesting, and I do think it is largely effective in that regard, and this episode probably deserves to be one of the better episodes from this season. Now, admittedly, I do feel like the top five episodes provide a bit more for me than this one, but this is still a very noble episode, a very enjoyable episode, and because of that, it is here at number six. Now we're moving on to number five, and I can understand why people may have this episode a bit lower in their estimations, and to be fair, I was a little on the fence when putting this episode as high as it is. However, the more I thought about it, I just figured that this is a very solid episode in its own right with some pretty interesting conflicts going on, all things considered, and one that I do find enjoyable on the whole. But here we have Top Bolt, and this is a pretty solid episode in my personal opinion. I mean, we obviously have Sky Stinger and Vapor Trail as being this sort of codependent friendship happening here where Vapor Trail is giving Sky Singer like wind so that he can fly much better than he can. And in turn, through him flying, that she at least kind of has a role in fulfilling his dream. So interesting sort of weird codependent relationship going on there. And I do like how later in the episode, they sort of explain their backstory as well, where it turns out that Sky Singer came from a big family where he was never noticed, which fueled his desire to be in the limelight while Vapor Trail is sort of the opposite, where she was an only child who got all the attention in the world from her parents and in turn, like, made her want to get more behind the scenes and sort of, through that, became friends with Sky Singer as a way of helping each other fulfill each other's purposes. And over time, it just fuels this perception of Sky Singer thinking he's this amazing flyer when he actually isn't that good. And on the other hand, Vapor Trail thinking she isn't really all that much when in reality she's better than she thinks she is. So that is definitely a very interesting dynamic and it's interesting to see it play out in this episode where obviously Twilight and Rainbow Dash, they go to the Wonderbolts Academy and try to figure out the friendship problem. And they have different approaches for going about it where Twilight wants to be blunt and honest about it while Rainbow Dash is trying to like hide it as like revealing too much will ruin their confidence. And also there is a running joke in the episode of Rainbow wanting to relax and get away from the Academy only for people to tell her to come. And she's like, I was just there. I don't know. That was just kind of a lame joke 
that was running through a lot of the episode. So at the end of the day, I actually do enjoy this episode quite a bit, and I wouldn't be surprised if it ends up going up on this ranking over time. I do think the top four episodes have a bit more to offer and are more consistently enjoyable throughout, but just the ideas that this episode presents make it very interesting for me, and because of that, it is here at number five. Now we're moving on to number four, and I feel like this episode is kind of on a similar footing to Top Bolt in a lot of ways, in terms of the story that it tells and the way it goes about it. However, I figured that this episode is a bit more enjoyable to watch than Top Bolt, but it's still pretty solid. And here we have Flutter Brother. And again, this episode is pretty interesting. It obviously introduces us to Zephyr Breeze, Fluttershy's brother, and seeing their relationship play out is very interesting. I mean, obviously Fluttershy is always a little introverted and maybe not super comfortable with interactions. But here with Zephyr, I mean, she is just completely like casual about it per se and obviously she's very open about how annoyed she can be by his antics and the fact that again she doesn't really shy away from that is like pretty interesting on its own and in turn Zephyr is very passive in its own right despite being very cocky on the outside and I always found the line very amusing where he tells Fluttershy that she was always the bossy one which is just very very funny in its own right. There's also like him hitting on Rainbow Dash, thinking that she has a crush on him, which is just ridiculous. And seeing like the way in which Fluttershy's parents deal with Zephyr throughout the episode is interesting as well. You really get a sense of where Fluttershy came from in terms of her like growing up in a household that was just as introverted, shy, and passive as she was at the beginning of the series. So seeing that sort of gives us an idea of where she came from. I mean, the fact that it's not simply due to bullying, I mean, is pretty interesting as well. And seeing the way in which the parents just completely let Zephyr walk all over them is amusing, but also to the point where Fluttershy steps in and refuses to put up with it anymore. Zephyr ultimately moves out, only to move into Fluttershy's place. And Fluttershy is like, I don't think this is what the parents had in mind. And Zephyr's like, well, I moved somewhere else. So, I mean, there's that to a degree. There's a whole storyline of uh, her forcing him to get a job. And he's trying all this different stuff only for it to blow up in her face, particularly when he's asked to clean the castle only for him to manipulate Spike into doing it. and. Spike's reaction where he's like, oh no, I wasn't asked to do it. Oh, Zephyr just convinced me that I was so much better at it and he needed a demonstration and then I ended up doing the whole thing. So there's that. Also, his attempt at like helping Rarity out is pretty funny as well. But then ultimately it culminates with Fluttershy kicking out Zephyr and then she feels bad. She goes out and finds him and it turns out that he's completely incapable of living on his own despite him protesting otherwise and then it's revealed that a lot of his character is driven by his fear of failure and lack of motivation which does lead into Fluttershy and Rainbow Dash helping him out they sing a pretty nice song I mean it's not the best song in the whole series per se but I do like the the song as a whole as well as the scene itself I guess like you know like leading into the song we have Fluttershy and Rainbow like directing Zephyr into the room and to tell him that he has to complete the main style that he was asked to complete and then she's like so Zephyr if things go wrong what are we supposed to do and then Zephyr's like beg for help and quit if I don't get any and then just seeing the reaction of Fluttershy and Rainbow like slowly coming down and then glaring at him I don't know that just found that Part pretty funny but again just makes the scene as a whole pretty interesting like and then the song itself is good as well like and Zephyr ultimately comes around to doing something on his own he eventually goes on to graduate from beauty school and again he is set on the right path there so on the whole I do find this to be a pretty interesting story of Zephyr like being this like pretty lazy person on the outside and seemingly someone who is just cocky on the outside but on the inside like he's just trying to cover up for his own fear of failure and him just trying to cultivate this bubble in which he's the very best where he doesn't have to be challenged all that much and then obviously that leads to all sorts of problems and Fluttershy being the one to really help him get out of that is very good on its own 
And plus, on top of that, the main reason I have this about Top Bowl is that it's just more entertaining to watch, in my personal opinion. I mean, while Top Bowl is more probably a bit more interesting in terms of the ideas it presents, I feel like Flutter Brother does a similar job, but definitely has more entertainment going for it with more humor in it, but also the song towards the end that makes it a bit more memorable for me. So I do think this is a pretty solid episode, all things considered, and definitely one of the better ones from season six. But I feel like the top three have a bit more to offer at the end of the day. So because of that, I do have to leave it here at number four. Now we're moving on to number three. And this is an episode that I've always really enjoyed a lot. And while it's not a perfect episode, it is one that is pretty solid on its own. But here we have the fault in our cutie marks. And again, this is a very solid episode. I mean, it obviously gives us Gabby, who is a very interesting character on her own. She's this griffin that comes along and is inspired by the events of the Lost Treasures of Griffinstone in order to think that the only way to like be a good person or a good griffin per se is to have her own cutie mark. And she goes to the CMC to try to get that done. And I always find that aspect to be a little interesting. I mean, as I sort of alluded to in some previous episodes, I do think one of the themes throughout a lot of the series is this idea that ponies are the center of the cultural world uh, here in Equestria in the idea that other creatures like have these cultures that have these deep fundamental flaws while pony culture is not presented in the same way does lead to something like this where Gabby thinks that the only way for her to have a purpose in life is to adopt this pony thing that only ponies can get. And I do think future seasons of the show address this discrepancy in various ways. And I actually think this is one of the more interesting examples of this, where again, Gabby is trying to get a cutie mark despite the fact that she is not a pony. And the CMC literally just go along with this, with Scootaloo even getting to inject some like reasoning involving her inability to fly again tying in her whole disability behind this is a very interesting way of going about this again this is still before the washouts when she has fully accepted the fact that she'll never be able to fly it's like she's still trying to hold out hope that maybe the impossible can be done and obviously that gets translated into them attempting to get gabby her cutie mark only for her to be good at literally everything she tries here I mean, obviously, there's a song in this episode, which is pretty good. I actually really enjoy the song quite a bit. It's actually kind of catchy. But through it, the CMC realized that Gabby is not getting her cutie mark when she's good at everything. And the scene where they tell Gabby that they can't help her is pretty touching on its own. I mean, we have Gabby, like, trying to be in denial here. And she's, like, struggling to wrap her head around the idea that the CMC can't help her. And she just absolutely refuses to accept it and ends up running off, which makes the CMC pretty upset. Like they come around to the idea that they failed only for Gabby to come back shortly thereafter and show off her fake cutie mark that she's passing off on her as her own. And she attempts to just show it off to make them feel better before running off before they can find out the truth. And I always love the scene where they find out that the cutie mark is fake. Like, she falls in the mud, and she's like, oh, is everything all right? Oh, yes, it's my cutie mark. And then Sweetie Belle's like, oh, you mean the one that's stripping off your flank? And then Gabby's reaction is just like, yep, that's the one. I don't know. I always found the delivery of that line to be very amusing. And I feel like the resolution is pretty touching on its own. Now, the one nitpick I have with this episode is Gabby's reasoning for the fake cutie mark, where... She says that the main reason she did it was because, yes, she was upset, but she wanted to make the CMC feel better. And for me, that was kind of a cop out considering everything we saw throughout the course of the episode. And especially given Gabby's emotional reaction to finding out that she can't be helped. I mean, she very clearly was upset. And based on what we saw through that moment, it sort of implies that yeah, maybe she did paint a cutie mark on her flank because she wanted to pretend that she had gotten one. And I felt like it would have been interesting for her to fully accept in that scene that you know, like she doesn't need a cutie mark in order to have a purpose or to do good in society. But the fact that she made that realization off screen and that the whole 
like scheme of faking your cutie mark was no more than an attempt to make the CC feel better. I don't know. I found that a stretch too far and I felt like it would have been better if it was her still like in denial over her refusal to like not get a cutie mark. So I don't know. I found that to be a little bit of a nitpick, but that doesn't take away from how enjoyable this episode is. And in turn, like what it does for the series where Again, by the end, Gabby still does learn the lesson of how she doesn't need a cutie mark in order to have a purpose. She doesn't need a cutie mark in order to have fulfillment. And in turn, like she can go back to Griffinstone and really impose some positive change as a Griffin. And I do think that does set the series in the proper direction in terms of embracing the fact that ponies are not the only race of characters that can actually do good or have good values. And again, the story, even taking that out, the episode itself is very enjoyable. Gabby is a very interesting character on her own. And just seeing her going throughout this episode and like go, trying to learn this lesson while the CMC are very much involved in it makes it a very enjoyable episode for me and definitely one of the best of season six. However, I feel like that flaw of Gabby not actually learning that lesson on screen and her having this really flimsy excuse for why she faked the cutie mark when they had a very obvious and easy reason for her doing so that could have made the episode more interesting is enough to keep it outside the top two, but it's still a very solid episode. And it is here at number three. Now we're moving on to number two. And in case you couldn't tell, both these episodes are Starlight episodes. Episodes that I've already talked about in previous videos. And I actually thought coming into it that I would retain the order that I had had for these episodes coming into it. However, after thinking about some more and just re-watching some of them, I did decide to make a change here. But at number two, we have the season six finale to wear and back again and it's still a very solid two-parter for me i mean and it's a very satisfying resolution to starlight's redemption arc just the whole idea of starlight like getting together some of her friends like trixie and discord these characters who have obviously been villains in the past but have since come around they really get to take the center stage here in resolving the conflict here and in turn they spend a lot of the episode in the a changeling hive and then try to navigate that there's just a very uh, long series of fun events there of them like eventually trying to find where all the ponies have been captured and along with that trying to talk down chrysalis and i still do like the ending where like starlight attempts to talk down chrysalis and encourage her to change only for her to refuse to do so and i find that element to be pretty interesting and obviously setting up Chrysalis's eventual return in season nine. So the fact that Chrysalis refuses reform, even when faced with other ponies who are like her, who have taken that direction, is a very interesting turn for the series. So I find that to be pretty interesting. I also really love the scene where Starlight comes to the village in order to partake in the festival. Her fearing that she's going to be rejected only for the ponies to not only accept her, but to put her back into her leadership position and her just refusing to do that and her literally pushing them away and then her being in this fetal position before Trixie helps her get out was always a very compelling scene for me. So I still find this episode to be very, very interesting on its own and definitely one of the better two-parters in the series for me and it's deserving of being this high on the list. However, after thinking about some more, I did decide that the number one episode did do a little bit more. It did have a bit more intrigue going on, and I just found it a bit more entertaining consistently throughout its runtime than this two-parter, as good as it is. So because of that, I did decide to leave it here at number two. And now, at number one, the best episode of season six for me. I kind of already gave it away, but it is no second prances. And yes, I did make a switch here. I did previously have this one below to wear and back again on my Starlight episode ranking. And it's always been an episode that I enjoyed a lot. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, even from the beginning, I sort of saw it for what it was. Like, it did tie quite a bit into Starlight's redemption arc while smoothing over a lot of the issues that I had. Again, at the time that Starlight chose to become a better pony I felt that was kind of rushed and Twilight was a bit too quick to forgive Starlight there like without any conditions really 
So obviously I recognize this episode as being a complication to that in a positive way here. However, I will admit that I did kind of struggle with deciding just how much it really tied into that at the end of the day. I mean, was it simply just a course correction or was it something that really added more than like it I gave it credit for? And for a while, I kind of assumed that it was good, but I kind of also recognized a lot of the arguments that people who didn't like this episode were, were making that Twilight was too out of character, that she was being too inconsistent here, that she was having this weird double standard for Starlight here compared to Trixie. And in turn, like, I felt like that kind of made me hold back a bit from declaring this one of the better episodes of the series. However, as time has gone on and I just thought about it more and more, I did come around to seeing just how solid this episode truly is in the Starlight Redemption arc, or at least the Starlight Redemption arc as I understand it. Because if you really think about it, I mean, yes, I mean, there is a debate for Twilight here being out of character and her being like really not that fair to Starlight at the end of the day. However, the big thing with Twilight here is that she very much views Starlight as a bit of a project here. I mean, when she took Starlight on to be the student in order to do good, I mean, yes, she did care a lot for Starlight and she genuinely wants to make her a better pony. However, she also recognizes that a lot of this is based around her making sure that she's getting the proper information and making sure that she's the one who's ensuring that Starlight gets the proper guidance in order to become a better pony. But then with Trixie, I mean, yes, Trixie's crimes were not as severe as someone like a Starlight's, but Twilight still recognizes that Trixie is someone who is very egotistical, someone who is very cocky, and in turn, someone who could potentially be a bad influence on Starlight. And through that, Twilight really wants to make sure that Starlight isn't being a bad influence and she does kind of question like whether she's being unfair to Trixie or Starlight but then later on towards the climax when Starlight skips out on the dinner that Twilight set up in order to show Celestia just how good of a job she's doing I mean she does see that as validation that Trixie is being a bad influence that she's causing her to slack back on her like friendship work and in turn like she's just making it so that Twilight is unsure whether Starlight's getting like the proper information that she's needed. And in turn, we get to a lot of Trixie's involvement in this episode where she does genuinely want to change. I mean, and considering the fact that she is someone who has this vendetta against Twilight, and that's probably the only major negative that Trixie has, at least in Twilight's eyes. I mean, it does make sense why She's not necessarily an evil person that wants to take over the world. I mean, considering she already tried that and failed. However, she is someone who at least wants to get a one up on Twilight. This pony who has already come in, run her out of town with her business when she was just doing simple magic tricks. And then later on, bested her again, despite her having this powerful amulet. So for Trixie, I mean, yes, while she is cocky to a degree, she's not really shown to be evil per se anymore. She is more so someone who just wants to get the best of someone who really exposed her and made her life a whole lot worse. And Starlight relates to that to a degree. And through that, they get to their friendship. And their friendship is pretty interesting in this episode. I know that future episodes definitely make it less enjoyable in various aspects. But at least here, like we have a very solid basis for why they end up becoming friends, why they end up connecting, and why they do grow to like each other to a degree and how they kind of understand each other as being misunderstood. So there's that. I also, as a side note, really love the segment when Starlight is trying to befriend like ponies that the main six were setting up, only for her to completely fail in that regard. Like when she tries talking to Rainbow Dash, and she doesn't know what the a Wonderbolt is because she was too busy enslaving villages. You know, like there's her whole scene of her in the park, and she's like yelling to herself and drawing all this unwanted attention. There's a moment where she's trying to like get Big Mac to talk more and she casts a spell on him, forcing him to talk. And that makes Applejack really upset. There's the moment where she's trying to bake a cake and uh, Mrs. Cake sees that as Starlight trying to run her out of business. So 
in a lot of ways, like Starlight is shown to be pretty desperate here. And we do see her being misunderstood, which again, considering the fan reception to her is not uncalled for and not completely unreasonable at the end of the day. So to see that also playing out in universe, again, not only works for a story, not only makes it for a pretty entertaining segment, not going to lie, but also like properly sets up her friendship with Trixie here. So there's that. Obviously, they spent a lot of the episode with Twilight trying to micromanage Starlight as well. Again, this is in considering this is the first full episode after the premiere to really focus on Starlight's studies here and Twilight's relationship to her as a teacher. And the fact that we are starting to see more of these negative aspects more immediately is something at least. And I feel like that is something that helps the episode to a degree. We then get to the scene where Twilight confronts Starlight and Trixie. And again, Trixie admits that she won against Twilight. And obviously that leads to a massive misunderstanding. And I actually do find this misunderstanding to be a bit more justified than some others. Now, again, it's not great that there's a misunderstanding at all. But again, considering we know Trixie's whole spiel about one to one out Twilight, which was made clear from earlier in the episode. And considering the fact that she does genuinely like Starlight and attempts to get that across, only for her to say beating Twilight was just a bonus, which, again, nice callback, but obviously that makes Starlight upset. She runs off, and obviously that leads to Twilight telling her that she has won. I hope you're happy. And then Trixie tries to say, guess I'm back to a one-pony show, which is exactly the way she likes it. Thank you, Twilight, for getting rid of that annoying pony that wanted to be my first friend. I am not sad at all. I definitely don't feel like my heart is breaking into a million pieces. I don't know. I find that moment to be very iconic on its own. But through that, Twilight realizes that Trixie genuinely did care for Starlight and that she was just trying to make a friend. But then Twilight just got in the way again, sort of bringing back some of the old storylines, particularly from Ghostbusters, how Twilight literally just intervened in Trixie's life for Seemingly no good reason, I feel like, so to see that playing out here is pretty interesting. We obviously get Twilight's talk with Starlight, how she's trying to make sure that Starlight's getting the right information, but ultimately comes to learn that Starlight needs to make her own choices, much like how Celestia entrusted her to make her own decisions. And I think this moment right here is pretty good on its own. I mean, and again, I feel like it ties into Twilight seeing Starlight as this project where Again, like she's not only trying to make Starlight a better pony, but deep down, she's also trying to ensure that her lessons of friendship really do translate to others and that she is trying to save the day here, like not really thinking too much about the actual pony that is being affected here. So for Twilight to learn this lesson that Starlight is more than just this project, that she's an actual person with her own preferences, her own personality and her own decisions is pretty heartwarming on its own. And then obviously they save Trixie here after it seemed like she was trying to kill herself or at least intentionally put herself into a dangerous position without any like safety net there, only for Starlight to save her at the end of the day. And again, it's a very nice heartwarming ending, all things considered. So like I said, I always really enjoyed this episode and consider it to be one of the better ones of season six, even though I did understand why people were not a big fan of it. And I understand that I, at the end of the day, people may still see Twilight as being out of character here. But for me, I feel like it does fit very strongly into the redemption arc, not only in terms of Starlight coming around to making her first friend, but also in terms of Twilight realizing her own role in all this. That's not just as simple as Starlight accepts friendship and you, know, you just go from there. That is very much this equal exchange. And in turn, Starlight is not just this project, which she probably could have come off as based on like how Starlight turned around so quickly and how it was entirely Twilight's idea for Starlight to become her student in the first place. So to see like their relationship evolve beyond that point is very compelling for me and definitely one of the more interesting aspects to this episode per se. And just on top of that, I mean, I do think that this is a consistently enjoyable episode I mean, there's plenty of funny moments with Starlight attempting to bond with others only to completely fail. Like there's her, I haven't even mentioned like her scene at the beginning where she's saying, make my first friend. Well, I guess I'll just force 
ponies to be my friend and take over all of Ponyville. And the fact that Twilight doesn't even see that she's joking here, that she gives a very serious starlight, just again, just shows the lack of trust that Twilight has and started to make her own decisions there. Again, pretty funny, but also pretty uh, good with the themes here. And like I said, I do think there's some pretty heartwarming moments in here, as well as some pretty emotional moments. I do think this is a pretty complete episode, all things considered, both on its own, but also in terms of fulfilling like the broader themes and story arcs of season six. So I do find this episode to be slightly more enjoyable, or at least based on my more recent rewatch of it, which does lead me to put it here at number one. And there we go, that will do it for this week's video. If you like this content, be sure to like and subscribe, it really helps out with the channel. And obviously I'll be back again soon to do the ranking for season seven, so stay tuned for that. We're chugging along here with all these seasons. And of course, I eventually plan to make a all-time episode ranking for MLP Friendship is Magic, so stay tuned for that, where I basically combine these lists. Stay tuned for that. Obviously I'm making videos for other shows as well, so stay tuned for those as well. And if you haven't already, be sure to join my Discord server. I'll leave a link to join in the description. A lot of stuff coming your way. But for now, that is the video. See ya.